All right. Um, on va le faire en anglais parce que c'est le c'est le c'est le standard de, des conférences d'aujourd'hui. So I'm going to switch into uh, into uh, English. Welcome to uh, to all of you. This is the uh, um, the panel about family businesses. Um, I'm Anthony Atia. I'm a, I'm a managing board member of Euronext, and I'm very pleased to have with me. Uh, today, uh, Antoine uh, Flochel, uh, who is a VP of uh, Ibsen. Um, Guillaume Delorme, uh, who works uh, as a member of the uh, analyst team and portfolio management of Odo BHF uh, uh, Asset Management. Christophe uh, Saubier, who is a partner at Deloitte uh, Family. And Eric Forrest, who is the chairman and CEO of Enternext, uh, the subsidiary uh, uh, of uh, uh, Euronext, working on, on SMEs. Um, our topic today is, um, well, it's, it's a very broad one, um, and so we called our debate uh, how to support and finance family-owned companies, um, and we also want to uh, uh, put it in front of, uh, of the, you know, the, the European capital uh, market, so we think it's a, it's a special or unique uh, European asset class, and so uh, we're here to, uh, to, to debate about that. We hope that uh, uh, you're also going to participate with some questions. Um, and uh, before we start the uh, the, uh, the discussion, I would like to uh, frame a little bit what we what we mean by uh, by family-owned uh, companies in uh, Europe. Um, first of all, uh, family-owned businesses are the key are a key for the dynamism of uh, European economies. Um, according to the European Commission, uh, they represent 50% of the of the GDP. Um, so it's not just about uh, SMEs or, or mid caps. Uh, it's it's all sorts of uh, of uh, fa uh, family-owned uh, businesses. Recent studies underline their ability to outperform the economy all over the, uh, an economic uh, cycle. So, in itself, this is a good reason to uh, uh, to talk about it and to to understand how uh, how they how they work. Uh, more than 230 family businesses are listed on your next market. 230 family businesses out of 1,300 equity issuers on the euro next, uh, with a market cap of over 722 billion euros. Uh, so family businesses make up more than 20% of issuers listed on our on your next uh, countries. Until the end of the 90s, a large number, of large number of family businesses resorted to capital market to finance their growth and provide liquidity to family uh, uh, shareholders. Uh, the market downturns in the 2000 and 2010 uh, decade uh, uh, changed that, and uh, we see we saw after that less and less uh, family-owned uh, businesses uh, accessing uh, the market, and this is the reason why. Euronext launched uh, a few months ago uh, several initiatives around it, and we're going to talk about it today. But it's not just about that, obviously. Um, and so I'm very pleased to, uh, you know, to uh, to get with us today and, and to to discuss with Antoine, Christophe, Guillaume, and uh, and uh, Eric about uh, the topic. So before before we start the the debate, I would like to put forward a few um, a few cliché, a few common wisdom about family-owned businesses, and we uh, we still. Uh, we still find them when we have discussions with investors, for instance, or even with CEOs or, 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 or family-owned uh, businesses. Uh, cliche uh, number one is um, um, uh, if I um, if I open the capital of my family-owned business, I will lose the control uh, of the overall uh, business. Cliche uh, number two: um, uh, transparency. Uh, is is going to damage my ability to compete and is going to disclose my my business plan to my competitors. Uh, cliche number three: um, a large cap cannot be a family-owned business. Uh, it's just SMEs. And cliche number four: um, family-owned businesses are adverse to risk, and so they have a slow growth and they can't be high-growth uh, companies or even technology uh, uh, companies. So these are all. Uh, false statements, and we're going we're to talk about that uh, also in our uh, debate. Um, enough talking. Uh, I will uh, I will leave the floor to our uh, panelists with the first uh, first uh, question, um, which is very much about the definition of family-owned uh, businesses. So, um, Guillaume, what's your what's your view on uh, on 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 what is what is a family-owned uh, business? Yeah. Um, th there could be many definitions around uh, family-owned businesses. Uh, so it's pretty difficult to characterize uh, once for all uh, what is a, a family-owned business. Uh, but at Odo, and since uh, Odo Generation once, uh, was launched in 1996, uh, the uh, fund that invests in a listed family-owned company, uh, we, we have set a definition that has not changed since, uh, and we use uh, three criteria 
to uh, characterize uh, family-owned uh, company, the first one, and those criteria are really pragmatic and qualitative. So we are not using a precise percentage of voting rights or something like that. We, we want to uh, ensure that uh, first a family or a group of individuals have the, the power to, to, to choose or to dismiss the management team. Uh, this is the, the most important point in our uh, view. Uh, and this is the, the, the first criteria. The second one is the fact that uh, the, the investments in the, in the listed company should account for the majority, for the, for the bulk of the fortune of this family or those individuals. Uh, and for us, it's important as a minority shareholders because we, we want to have a, a clear correlation uh, between the share price appreciation over time and the fortune of the family. And the, the last criterion is the fact that uh, those individuals should have a long-term horizon and ideally uh, have the clear will to transmit uh, the company to the next generation. So th that's the, the definition we, we use, but uh, I agree that it's uh, subject to debate and uh, we, we are clearly open to, to debate. I think the, the concept of generation is absolutely key and it's probably uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, we need to look at this, uh, this area in uh, with, a, with, a, with a fresh, uh, fresh set of eyes. Um, uh, Christophe, uh, what's, what is your view? How, how do you define uh, family uh, businesses from, <laughs> from an investor or an issuer uh, point of view? Well, I, I fully agree with Guillaume. If we look at the at internet, we can find uh, probably uh, hundreds of definitions. But from our view, uh, well, uh, as, as soon as the, the, the family has a, a significant role to, uh, to choose the, the, the managers and uh, uh, as soon as uh, it is uh, transmitted uh, from generation to generation or about to be transmitted, this is a family business. Antoine, I think you have a, you have a view that you can develop on, the, on governance uh, particularly. Uh, on the governance of um, family companies, I think one of the um, interesting things is to understand what has to be done at the level of the family in the holding company or in the shareholders agreement pact and what has to be done at the level of the listed company. And um, we have had uh, a lot of thoughts on this at Ipsen. Um, in order to have some boundary setting at the level of the holding company and the normal strategic and uh, uh, operational um, orientation dealt with at the level of the board of the listed company. Thank you, Eric. Eric, in terms of um, independence, do you characterize family businesses are as uh, w willing to remain independent or is it, is it a vision from the past? No, I think they, they, they do will to remain independent. Uh, after that, we, we have to define what does it mean to be independent. Uh, I do think it's quite different from the control. You, you, you may own only 30 or 40 percent of the company and you will be independent. So that's, that's a key point and probably we'll discuss a bit later about it. Um, but you, you know, it's very difficult indeed to define what is a family-owned business because I, I do think that depending on the sectors, depending on the size of the companies, probably you can find uh, very different companies, and they are both or all family-owned businesses. Um, as as Euronext, we have been obliged, I would say, to define what is an, a family business because uh, as you have launched some index, it was uh, mandatory for us to have a clear definition to avoid any discussion after that. So we have, uh, <coughs> we have three, three quantitative, I would say, criteria. First one, that the family or families um, remain uh, reference shareholders of the company. Second one is that at least one of the family members uh, is involved in the governance, board member or, or something like that. And uh, lastly, uh, at least one, um, we are talking about the second generation and the second generation is running the company. Otherwise, there is a strong and clear commitment for transmission uh, to be sure that we are talking about a long term horizon, as you mentioned, it's very, very important. So. On the top of this, you're right, independence is a key word, and when we discuss with all these companies, uh, this is probably during the five first minutes of the discussion, they mention independence, control, 
we uh, we do we don't need anybody to help us we want to uh, to be uh, at, the, at the top of the company and just to manage a company and that's key and we may explain that uh, at the end a listing is not uh, a way to lose <laughs> to lose the control to lose the independency uh, to the contrary when you look at the existing listed company you mentioned the number of uh, family businesses listed companies the family has still the control of the company and the independence so what is uh, what is it that is changing in the la in the landscape today that makes that we have this conversation uh, what is your view um, eric uh, i think on the uh, uh, what do you see on the ground when when you meet with uh, with the uh, companies that make 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 you uh, want to want to spend more time with them and uh, yeah. and convince them to uh, to to uh, use the capital market i think world is changing business is changing so these companies are also changing and we have a lot of new generations coming uh, uh, coming to uh, to manage and to lead the company and they have also in mind some uh, business challenges and they have to uh, to face some uh, interesting business challenges international r&d new products new markets higher competition and so on so uh, they have no other choice that to change their mind their way of working or thinking transparency is no longer a taboo transparency is now a kind of obligation when you want to be um, as very active in other countries when you want to work with uh, i would say uh, suppliers or or clients of uh, tier one you need to be more transparent and when you discuss with the next generation we have the feeling that this kind of uh, uh, reluctance regarding uh, communication transparency is becoming lower uh, because they have in mind f as, a, as a priority to develop business and to become uh, a leader in the in the sector so uh, things are i think are, are are changing uh, very very uh, fast and the last point i would like to mention is that we we see more and more family business companies uh, who, uh, which decide to uh, to hire external managers so there there is a mix of uh, family managers and external managers which is quite new especially in france uh, christophe what is your uh, point of view because you're on the ground as well you you know you meet uh these uh, these companies every day. What what do you see uh, changing there? Uh, well, uh, in the light, we the the, tr the, the choice we have we have made uh, a few years ago is to mainly uh, be in touch with the new generation. So uh, most of the time in our events, uh, we are with uh, with uh, uh, guys from a uh, family business uh, who are uh, between twenty five and forty, uh, and this is an, uh, this is the what we we have done in the past and now we are starting but what we observe is that they need to be together and they, they need to better co communicate so now we mix the two generations but uh, having uh, worked a lot with uh, the new generation uh, of course the, the the business is changing but they are they are changing with the business and they are now now very aware that they have to uh, they have to be uh, they have to be to to uh, uh, to be uh, very close to the changes, to to innovate, to uh, to go out, to go out of France, to 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 uh, to to, uh, to to grow, to uh, and uh, they can't be uh, they can't be uh, they can't remain uh, small companies, and as well they have to open the, their balance sheet, they have to to uh, to be ready to invite people uh, at the top of the balance sheet, at the bottom of the balance sheet, they have to to. Uh, to hire uh, independent board members, and this is very, very new. Uh, and most of the time, there is a big fight bet between the, the new generation and the old generation because they, they it needs a lot of time for them to, to agree. But it, it's, uh, it's moving and it's uh, changing. And do you see differences between France and the other European uh, countries there? Um, we have a we have a group of 20 23 uh, member firms and we share most of those uh, those issue uh, in all the countries uh, the, the, the 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 big difference between France and other country is that there is only a very few percentage of uh, family owned business that are transmitted in France it's between 12 and 40 per 14 percent and out of France uh, Germany is 60 percent and uh, so that's something uh, we have to work on hardly. 
transmission. Yeah. And so how, how does that work? Can you can you can you tell us if they use the well, what, the, what, 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 what tools? Uh, uh, the, 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 the best thing to, 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 uh, to, to transmit is to, to prepare it. And the, you do, you, 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 if you wait to, have to be uh, 60 or 70 years old, it's too late. And uh, then you do it, and you do, do, do not do it properly. So w what we do is that we, 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 we communicate a lot, and that the university we have in uh, October is about that, is transmission, is... Uh, working with the new generation and uh, the generation which uh, who is running the business and to say well now you have to sit together and you have to work and you have to think and you have to talk and you have to communicate and you have to say uh, to, to each other what you what you want to do together including what you want to do in terms of transmission and that's very basic but uh, that's the way to uh, to encourage it Antoine, that's I, I see taking a the mic do you have a do you have a, a view on the um, my, my view on this is a little tainted by the fact that uh, my experience in the pharmaceuticals business and uh, in the pharmaceuticals business, basically everybody is listed. Uh, there are very, very few uh, private firms, uh, even in Europe, the bulk of the industry is listed. Um, even fledgling companies with products in the clinical development stage are listed. So. Um, the name of the game is to be listed, uh, and it's a key element to attract talent to be on the map. You have to be listed. So I would say that the, um, the evolution that uh, our colleagues were describing does not apply that much to uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, per se. Maybe, um, maybe with, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, in generic terms about family businesses. Maybe, maybe we want to take a few examples that are known uh, in the market. So, um, yeah. so do you want to... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yep, yep. Yeah, because w one of the cliché that came to my mind, in addition to what uh, Anthony mentioned earlier, the fact that uh, family-owned companies could be kind of old-fashioned or slow to react. And uh, as a manager of Auto Generation, we clearly can conclude it's a wrong idea. And uh, we have many examples showing that either internally or externally, companies uh, uh, in the space of family-owned companies are, in the contrary, pretty uh, fast to react. And uh, I can mention, for instance, the example of Inditex, the owner of the Zara brand, the Zara chain, that has clearly become a model for many retailers across the world. Uh, they have uh, built a state-of-the-art logistics, IT, RFID, uh, systems uh, that has proved to be the, the, the best uh, and clearly the company uh, uh, has uh, surpassed its competition uh, based on its uh, know-how and it, uh, its uh, excellence in terms of uh, operations but it can be also some uh, uh, some courage regarding uh, acquisitions if you take for instance the example of Pernod Ricard in the last decade the company engaged in three transformational acquisitions. It was Seagram, uh, Allied Domec, and Absolute that clearly changed the dimension of Pernod Ricard and uh, that made Pernod Ricard the second uh, biggest distiller, uh, spirits vendor in the world today. A very profitable company. And uh, at that time, uh, the management of Pernod Ricard clearly needs uh, some courage to, to, to lead such a, such a transformation. So it shows that uh, uh, family-owned companies are not only uh, old-fashioned, uh, very local companies, but uh, on the contrary, you have uh, very uh, fast-moving uh, companies in that, in that space. And so uh, let, let's get into the, the details. H how do startup funders uh, can keep the control of their uh, uh, company while opening up their capital and, uh, and, in uh, and inviting other, other type of investors? If I start, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, first, you, you are not obliged to, to sell more than 50% of the, of the capital or the voting rights at first. Mm -hmm. If I take again the example of Inditex, Armand Suartega still control uh, close to 65% of the company. It's a company that is worth uh, more than 120 billion euro today. Uh, and you, you are not in the obligation to, to sell the majority of the capital. And even if you... Um, 
to control only 25 or 30 percent in a listed company it's usually sufficient to, to keep the control and to keep uh, the, 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 the key decisions uh, in your hands so that's not something that should afraid uh, at first uh, and that's something that is perfectly uh, doable if I may add something, when you look at the, uh, the free float at the IPO time, the average free float is probably in a range from uh, 20 to 30 percent, so it is a maximum at the IPO time, so there is room for dilution after that before, before losing the control. Uh, there, is, there are also some, I would say, technical tools. The double venting rights uh, is a good, I would say, protection for uh, historical uh, shareholders or founders. And um, we are talking about equity, but there are also other products which are not dilutive. And when you look, for instance, at the, um, at the uh, use of the capital markets uh, done by uh, family-owned businesses, they use a lot bonds, so bonds without any dilution, uh, which is a good way also to, uh, uh, to, to consolidate, I would say, or to, or to keep the control of the company. Um. On these voting rights, uh, it's quite ironical to notice that um, what used to be deemed a little cracra, as we would say in French, 10 years ago, uh, is now back in fashion. Uh, when you have a look at the internet companies that are getting a listing in the US, uh, some people have uh, 10 times the voting rights of others. So what used to not be very chic uh, becomes uh, more fashionable. Uh, but Notwithstanding that, um, there has to be a reflection on uh, the issuance on non-dilutive mainstream equity instruments. There used to be stuff called certificate d'investissement, things like that in France in the good old days, but they have essentially vanished. And uh, there are some PREF shares, but it's not a mainstream asset class, unlike what happens in the US. And I think there will have to be a reflection because unlike what uh, you were saying, Eric, I don't think a family will gladly see its shareholding go down to 20%. Because yes, you may control the shareholders meeting because nobody turns up, but you can't have the majority of the board seats if you own 20 or 30%. Nobody is going to accept that. So if you want to really control a business, you need to have kind of half of the board seats, because that's what you can use if you want to get rid of uh, mandataire social, uh, and that's what you can use in order to give the strategic orientation you want to the business. Uh, if you have 20%, you might have two board seats or three out of 12, and it's not going to be sufficient to, uh, to control the business in its day-to-day -day life. So I think we have to avoid going be mm, below the 50% threshold of uh, shares of voting rights. And for this, in order to finance those companies, I think it's very important to have a real liquid market with uh, non-dilutive equity instruments. Yeah, there is probably a mismatch indeed, which you I fully agree with you. When you look at, um, at the amount raised by uh, family-owned businesses on the market, listed companies, huh? Uh, we are talking uh, over the last five years uh, about 42 billion euros, uh, which of course is a significant amount of money, but there is a kind of mismatch because as Anthony has mentioned, these list family businesses companies represent 20% of the total of listed companies and roughly speaking a third in terms of uh, market capitalization. And the 42 billion, billion sorry, e euros represent only 5% of the total amount raised on the market during the same period. So there is a s huge room for improvement in terms of use of the markets by uh, family-owned businesses companies. Um, and to the contrary, we know that investors they like family businesses company, they are ready to invest. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Guillaume will, be, will agree. So there is a significant appetite from investors, but probably some reluctance from companies because of dilution, because of control and so on. And also, they, they, they just n don't know the, the, the mechanism and are they, they are just afraid. And it's uh, mainly about uh, explaining, and that was what we started with uh, Internext, is to, uh, to organize uh, meetings and sessions uh, to, to, uh, to invite uh, listed companies and non-listed companies. 
and the, 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 the more we explain and the better they, they understand and I do believe it's mainly uh, about explaining and uh, because uh, right now uh, most of them do not know exactly what is uh, w w what are the issues about control so this is one of the one of the barriers to um, to develop uh, the access to capital market for these businesses um, it's about explaining educating um, supporting so let's let's look at the, uh, the at, at the at the overall limits of the development of these family owned businesses uh, on exchange and so maybe the the first question is for is for eric um, uh, after the initial offering, after the IPO, uh, why is it that these businesses are still reluctant to use capital uh, market? You touch, you touch base on that, but can you can you develop uh, a little bit more? First, probably the dilution impact. Um, they, there is a lack of uh, understanding or education regarding these products and financial markets. So uh, they have in mind immediately that if they raise money, uh, they will be diluted, which is not acceptable for them. Um, so this is the first point. The second point um, is that um, probably their, um, the management of their financing policy is more conservative. So uh, when we when you look at the leverage, for instance, in this uh, kind of family of uh, companies, sorry, um, the leverage is uh, lower definitely compared to other companies. So before raising money, debt or equity, uh, they. Um, they must be convinced or fully, fully sure that they need this money to develop, to develop their business. Otherwise, they will wait for <laughs> the, the day they will definitely use the money. So I, I do think that they are more cautious, probably more pragmatic regarding, um, regarding the money and, and how, to raise the, how to raise money to, to finance their company. And uh, dilution remain, remains a, a, key, a key issue for them, of course. But fully agree with Christophe, there is a uh, lack of education uh, regarding all the financial products. N probably we have also um, an issue in terms of image or communication. Because uh, at least uh, since uh, the financial crisis in 2007, the buzz regarding the financial market is not a very positive one. We are talking about short term, we are talking about speculation, uh, and so on. So for a family, uh, family uh, business company, which is definitely long-term oriented and driven, uh, just listen <laughs> to speculation and short term and so on. I'm not sure this is the best way to convince them that financial market is a good and efficient tool. Precisely ab about the US, um, Antoine, the uh, uh, US has uh, promoted non-dilutive financial uh, instruments. Uh, Europe is late to that. Can you explain uh, to the audience how it works and why, uh, why we're late and wha what we should do? Uh, I wouldn't dare explaining to you guys what we should do because um, I am not competent enough. But I think they have a, a favorable tax treatment in the US on PREF shares uh, when institutional investors buy these shares. And it may explain why this has given rise to a, a fully liquid market. Um, I don't, f frankly speaking, I don't know why this has not developed in, in, in Europe. Uh, but I think there should be some reflections by the competent people uh, at Euronext and, and other bodies to, um, to try and, and invent financial products that would entice family-owned companies to go public or to raise more funds. Um, we have some uh, representatives of the European Commission here. I'm sure. I'm sure we can we can talk to them. Um, uh, Christophe, on the um, uh, on the on the governance of the board, um, what does it mean to open up? Um, what does it mean to grow through the market in terms of of, of organization? The what what is the what is the impact on the on the initial board, which is really the family board? It's not it's not the it's not the 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 the, uh, the target company board. But what, what so what do you tell your client when when they start growing, and when and when they start to be more visible in terms of of governance uh, changes, and 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 how how do they react? Well, m many of our companies uh, right now are small one and mid one. And uh, of course, they, they have to uh, to improve that structure, uh, including the board, the management, the competence of the board, and uh, they have to to uh, to be uh, to be aware that uh, if they, they are looking for, uh, for example, if you go to 
if you go listed uh, to be listed, you, you need a, a very good CFO, and uh, it's very likely that you don't have this CFO in the family. So you have to look out uh, of the family and to find it. Find it. So uh, and still, still now, um, many families are poorly structured, and they are try they are not. Uh, uh, making any difference between the board and the, 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 the lunch of the of Sunday and uh, so they have to, to go into more governance they, they have to anticipate the problems the, they have to, to to adopt some rules and some uh, well uh, governance is about rules is to say well in this case we do that in this case we do that uh, and when we have to decide that uh, uh, we are uh, doing this way we have a process and we have rules and uh, and that's something uh, we are working very hard with com with family owned companies to uh, to equip them uh, with rules with process with uh, with uh, uh, new uh, new habits uh, in the way to recruit and to uh, to staff the the, 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 the the business the board the, the, the and to, to to educate also the, the the shareholders and to say you have a right you have a uh, you have uh, obligations and uh, so you have to be aware of that and we have training sessions because uh, all this is not uh, is not uh, um, very clear for them I, I would add that uh, obviously the um, family company will have to biotransform itself um, one useful stage in my experience is going through um, private equity stage, which can be minority or majority, obviously preferably minority, uh, or development capital, which um, helps the company um, getting more formal in its processes, improve uh, cash management, reporting, and instill some governance, uh, including non-family board members uh, who are going to represent the new financial sponsor. Uh, there is a very big market in continental Europe, uh, wh whether it is mezzanine or uh, development capital funding or so on and so forth. So uh, I think it's a very useful step before getting a listing. Uh, it enables the company to adapt to a changing world. And I would uh, warmly recommend that as a as a prior step to um, to a listing, obviously. Now, um, before these companies, when they access financial market, become a Peugeot or Michelin, um, there is a there is a journey ahead, and liquidity is always one of the key topics. Uh, diffi difficult to define, difficult to measure, uh, but some of the observation that always comes back is that uh, family-owned businesses have a lower liquidity than others. Um, Guillaume, is that is that true? And is that a problem? How how do you how do you um, how do you work around that? Yes, uh, yeah, I would say that probably liquidity uh, for uh, an institutional uh, shareholder is the biggest issue regarding family-owned companies, because first, by definition, uh, you have a, uh, a free float that is uh, mechanically uh, lower compared to a widely held company, and second, due to their financial characteristics. Uh, the, the academic literature has clearly demonstrated, as Eric mentioned earlier, that those kind of companies are more profitable, uh, they tend to grow faster, so they, they generate more free cash flow, and they are in a better position to self-finance their developments. So you have two aspects that clearly uh, weigh on, uh, on the liquidity of family-owned companies. And uh, for an institutional shareholder, uh, like fund manager, pension funds, that's clearly uh, an issue. For an individual shareholder it could be different, but for us it's a, it's a limitation, a clear limitation. The, the way to address that uh, is probably the, the investment horizon you have to keep in mind when you invest in, fami in listed family owned companies. Uh, typically, uh, at in other generation we have a pretty low turnover, between 25 and 30 percent meaning that in, our, in average, we keep our investments for three to, two uh, to, to four years. Uh, so it's pretty long at the, uh, in the uh, financial industry, uh, but that's a way uh, to compensate for, for the lower liquidity. And in our view, uh, that's the, the price to pay 
to be uh, fully aligned with the, with the family uh, because it remains a, a powerful investment vehicle, uh, but not without uh, disadvantage and liquidity is uh, among the, the most significant ones. If I can slightly disagree on this liquidity argument, it reminds me of what the investment bankers like to tell you about critical mass. You never have critical mass. Whatever you do, you're always subcritical and you should always do a deal to gain critical mass. Liquidity, it's the same old speech. When, when our company went public, we had a 20% free float and a market cap of 1.5 billion. So the guys would say, you know, it's a problem. You have uh, uh, insufficient liquidity. It's going to be a, an issue. And they keep on saying the same thing. And now we're a 10 billion company with a 42% free float. And there are still some people telling us, you know what? The problem is that uh, you don't have the liquidity we'd like you to have. So I think it's a never-ending game. You know, it's like perfection. We'll never reach it. Yeah, probably one, one <laughs> answer could be that uh, from the beginning, you have changed, I would say, the category of investors attracted by your stock. It's a question of size. So it's, <laughs> it's a chicken and egg issue because at the beginning, you, you were too small for some investors. And now, even if you grow a lot, you are still too small for new investors. So it's a, it's a will. But at the end, at the end they, they are investing in your company. So even if liquidity, of course, is always an issue, um, it will not prevent investors to invest in your company. It will maybe have an impact on the size of their investment because at the end they have some uh, liquidity issue if they, ne if they need to disinvest very quickly. But uh, if they like your equity story, it's a like company, I'm sure they will invest. Yeah, that's the price to pay to get good returns. And, uh, yeah. If I may, I would like maybe to come back just uh, s some quick part about the governance issue. Because I, I do think, especially in France, we have the, uh, the habit to present the governance as a list of constraints, and you are just to tick the box, or the different boxes, um, dedicated committees, independent board members, and so on, to comply with the uh, governance code, and, and so on. Of course, this, this is true, and you, have to, you know, will have to respect all these uh, constraints, but on the top of this, I think the governance ought to, to implement a useful and in efficient governance is also very helpful for the company in terms of structuring, in terms of uh, bringing new experts or new um, um, abilities within the company through the board members, for instance. If you just decide to recruit two bo independent board members and that's it, you will uh, waste probably a lot, of a lot of time and energy. If you decide to select two independent board members able to bring to the company new expertise, network, uh, an, an international, for instance, uh, present and so on, it will help you. So this is one of our, I would say, uh, usual speech with, the, with companies, with non in companies. Just try to look at the governance constraint as a positive issue and not a negative one. Yeah, um, maybe um, I could add the comment that uh, I'm not sure the current governance code, um, which has a kind of one-size-fits-all approach um, corresponds to uh, many family businesses and there could usefully be some reflections to have some specific recommendations that would cater for family, but not only family, any company that has a control shareholder. So it can be also the, the companies under the aegis of a, a private equity fund. And to your uh, knowledge, our, our, our friends uh, in the UK or in the US have, a, have a s uh, kind of adapted the kind of a conduct or it's something that we should create from, from, from what we have in uh, Europe? Uh, I am not aware of uh, a code of conduct in the US or the UK uh, catering for family or controlled companies because the, uh, the way companies are dealt with in the US and the UK is mainly very dispersed shareholding. So uh, the one new thing is in the US with those recent internet IPOs where you have a real um, uh, uh, imbalance in terms of uh, uh, voting rights for certain classes of shareholders. But I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, 
hard and fast rules governing that. It's, something, uh, it's something an uncharted area. Yeah, uh, something we should look at and probably uh, we should uh, we should account to this uh, this conference next year to see if we, if we progress there. Um, so let's let's look at the um, at the benefits of um, uh, financial market towards these uh, these uh, family-owned businesses. Um, uh, Antoine, it's is is it just about visibility, or what's uh, what what does it bring to you as a as a you've seen you've seen different different uh, cases. What's what uh, what's the before and after in terms of, of benefits? Well, obviously the visibility is an important thing, and the fact that we were uh, in the normal bandwidth of listed companies, which was not the case before. So in order to attract talent, in order to be visible vis-a-vis -vis academia, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, potential partners, it's obviously much better to be uh, listed. Um, one added um, positive of being listed, obviously, is the fact that you have many eyes looking at the company. When you're a private company, you have a bunch of people looking at what's going on. Uh, they can be crooks, they can be imbeciles, they can be both, uh, and uh, you can have a nasty surprise at the end of the day. If you are a minority, 3% shareholder in a private company, you, you don't have a seat on the board, uh, you know, uh, bad stuff can happen. Um, if you're a listed company, you have a number of analysts, a number of investors who are going to have a look at the company. There are going to be comments. Uh, there are going to be judgments made by outside people. And so I don't say that the market is right at any point in time and at every point in time. But I say that on balance, uh, if you have a, 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 a downward trend on your share price, it may indicate that you have certain problems after a while. And uh, it, it, it can trigger some kind of uh, uh, warning for minority shareholders. So I think uh, listing provides uh, some um, safeguards to shareholders of uh, family companies. I think that's one of the, uh, um, of, of the most important elements. Having said that, you might be and it's uh, 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 the flip side of this. Sometimes you have to do transactions in a certain way, which you would not do if you were um, non-listed, uh, because, for instance, it would affect your EBIT uh, for two years, which would not be part of your equity story. So it has some constraints. There are some deals you would not do uh, as a listed company, which you would do and which would make sense as a private company. But uh, um, we can consider that it's the price to pay uh, for this additional visibility and for this kind of safeguard provided by the, the many eyes looking at the company. It's about, it's about also your ability to sell these deals to your shareholders with a kind of a, of a long-term view. So it's, it's harder, uh, but it's feasible, right? It's not... Well, uh, I'm not going to divulge confidential information, but in the good old days, we were doing a deal in a certain way because our advisors told us there's no way you can do the deal differently, although the way we did it was not the optimal one, because it's going to break your equity story. Uh, and if you divide by two, your EBIT, even though uh, cash-wise doesn't change much and so on and so forth, uh, you are going to disrupt uh, the perceptions of the, of the financial investors. And so we, 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 we chose a suboptimal way. So it has constraints, uh, but that's life. And so st staying on the, on, on the benefit side, um, we talked about transmission and handover and younger generation. How, how does it work? I mean, Eric, do you want to uh, share what, what you see? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to just to remind that uh, Sometimes the starting point for listing is the objective to raise money to finance the growth and development of the company. This could be the starting point, a good starting point. Um, after that, of course, um, probably listing is uh, also uh, one of the most efficient tools to remain in independent, if it is key for the company. And, and then to prepare the next step and the next generation, but also to probably monitor more properly the liquidity 
for the uh, members of the family. I just have in mind the um, one of the uh, CEO of a listed company just explained to me some years ago that the the lunch in uh, at Sunday were uh, smoother thanks to the listing because when they arrived to the valuation, the answer was very simple: stock price. And he told me, you know. It's much more easier now to discuss with the other members of the family about the valuation because we are talking about the stock price and the stock price is public every day, so there is no, no more discussion. Yeah, it's also a good way to prepare and to transmit the company. Uh, it's very important to, um, to prepare. We, we have th there are some tools, holding and so on. It could be also an opportunity to, uh, to propose to the managers uh, to buy shares and to be more involved, I would say, in the, in the shareholder, uh, shareholder structure, um, which is also feasible when you are not listed, but which, which is more difficult, I would say. It's, uh, it's just a question of uh, level of difficulty because uh, we are talking about liquid stock and, uh, and tradable stock, which, which are quite different. Um, so I, I do think that when we talk about family businesses, companies, the, um, the objective to be listed are a bit different compared to a, a young startup tech, very innovative, because for the startup, the only issue is to get money on a very regular basis, every year, every two years, whatever the dilution is. Uh, the dilution for a young startup is not, is not an issue. Uh, for a family, we are talking about, of course, raising money, but uh, with some, I would say, constraints linked related to the family or to the DNA of the company. And on the, to the contrary, it's also a good way to uh, work on the, uh, on the transmission on the handover and to prepare the next generation uh, for, uh, for running the business indeed. Thank you. Um, Christophe, um, on your side, uh, can, you, can you share with us a little bit more uh, what you see on the, uh, on the relationship between the CEO and the, and the family shareholders and, and a few examples on how being listed create balance there? At the beginning, sometimes it's not uh, uh, an easy exercise. Uh, I have one example in mind, and uh, the of course the CEO is uh, is like God, <laughs> but uh, that, that's something that needs time, and it uh, it needs to to, uh, to 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 improve with the time. Uh, but uh, when when a company uh, uh, is recently uh, listed, it it, uh, it needs time to to uh, to find the right way to to, uh, to 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 work with the to interact with the the, 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 the family and that's something we also work with because they they are uh, they are uh, when they structure the family they have a family circle or a family uh, association or a family uh, council uh, but they are not very clear at all on the uh, who is doing what, who has the, the right to do what, and uh, how they interact with the, how the, the, the family governance interacts with the corporate governance. So that's something we work very hard with them because it's totally not clear with for them. And uh, uh, right now I am working with a listed company in Reims, <laughs> and uh, it's... Uh, they just created. Uh, they are listed since uh, a few years, and they are created. They are starting to to uh, organize the family governance because now it's the second generation, and we are starting from the uh, from uh, from scratch. The it's absolutely unclear uh, what they what they have the right to do and how they have to they can do it, and th they want all the information. They want the same information uh, as the board members, so we have to to be. Uh, to do a lot of education, uh, and uh, the first work we do is uh, uh, educa educating education sessions. Thank you. So staying on the on the benefit side, uh, Guillaume, uh, can you take a few examples about uh, how family businesses perform versus others? And also, I think we are interested to hear about um, the empowerment that being listed can can create. Because I've heard a lot uh, companies, particularly in in countries like Portugal, saying, well. We need to be visible. We need to be listed because we need to be visible because we want to we want to gain markets. And in order to enter RFPs or to be to install our businesses in newer countries, we want to uh, we need we need these business cards that say that we are listed on the market, part of an index. Can you is 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 it true? Is it true everywhere? And can you can you uh, comment and elaborate on that? Yeah, I think this aspect can help a little bit. Uh, but for us, uh, the, the listing uh, is a. Uh, 
a powerful tool to improve the value creation uh, for, for a company. Uh, because first, the company, when it uh, goes public, has to clearly improve and raise the bar regarding uh, information system, reporting system, risk management systems. So the company has to improve its own discipline, and that's, uh, that could be seen at first as a constraint, but this is really a uh, powerful tool to, to, to increase the value, to reduce the mistakes that could be done by the management, and to, to, have a, and to get a better steering uh, inside, uh, inside the company. Second, uh, we are convinced that when a company goes public, the management, uh, be it uh, internal to the family or external, will have to review the strategy and to rethink the strategy and to, uh, uh, to see what kind of story uh, he wants to sell to the, to the market and that will force the management to, uh, to analyze, to, uh, to see uh, the, the, the profitability division by division, whereas in a non-listing, uh, in a non-listed company, probably that some divisions will cross-subsidize others, and that's it. But in terms of capital allocation, the fact that the company is listed uh, will avoid that kind of. Uh, mistake and that will unlock value for all stakeholders, shareholders, yes, but also uh, employees, uh, suppliers, and so on. So that's a, a real powerful tool. I can imagine that it's not without uh, uh, pain for a family to give more information, more disclosure, but at the end, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful tool to increase discipline, uh, reporting, and so on. In terms of, uh, of performance, yes, we, we have uh, decided to create a fund invested in family-owned company because uh, we are clearly convinced uh, it's a, a really fantastic investment vehicles uh, to get very uh, satisfactory returns. Uh, and if I can give a figure regarding the performance of, uh, of auto generation, for instance, over the last 10 years, uh, so between what was almost the previous peak of June 2007, so between June 2007 and June 2017, annually the fund uh, got a return, a net return of 6.8%, so annual return of 6.8%, and if I look at the SBF 120 net return, it's 2.1%, and the stock uh, 600 net return, so net dividend uh, reinvested, it's 2.6%. So auto-generation outperformed annually by more than four percentage points uh, the general indices. So that's uh, pretty, pretty significant as an outperformance. And it shows uh, it's not always, uh, it's not only our talent, it's uh, uh, mainly the fact that we invest in pretty good companies uh, that are really focused on their operations. Uh, and we have the chance to to, to have a family along with us that protect us uh, and that shows that uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve uh, very, very good returns. Very um, um, impressive, thank you. So um, this panel has a bias uh, to support access to capital market for family-owned businesses, as, as you understood. Now, um, let's spend the, maybe the last uh, five minutes before we take questions on the, concretely, how, how, can, we, how can we recreate this uh, this uh, flow of deals from family owned businesses to capital market um, uh, because as, as we said earlier it was, was something that was quite natural in the uh, in the, uh, before before uh, the 90s um, how, how can we change that and maybe Eric uh, Eric uh, you, you can you can share the um, the experience of the of the new uh, your next offering yeah um, there were two main issues one for the already listed companies and the other one for non-listed companies. And we have tried to address both of them, and we have decided and launched some uh, initiative dedicated to these family businesses companies uh, some months ago. Regarding uh, how to help um, these companies to boost or to increase their visibility toward investors, because that's key at the end, about li that's key for liquidity, that's, that's, uh, that's key for raising money and so on. Um, first of all, we have, uh, which was uh, the first time in Europe, uh, we have designed and launched an index with uh, 90 
European family business listed companies. Uh, for the first time, we have small, mid and large cap companies in the same index, 30, 30, 30. Uh, all sectors, of course, and the four countries of Euronext. Um, and to give you uh, an idea of the performance, because uh, uh, this index has been launched at the beginning of the year, but uh, if we look at the uh, performance of the index since May uh, 2016, performance is plus 27% compared to plus 15 for the CAC 40. Just an illustration about the performance of the family businesses company. So, um, by this index, uh, by launching in this index, we, we try to, uh, to, get to give more visibility to, this, uh, to these companies. And I, I may say that it works. We, we, we got a lot of incoming calls from asset managers about the index, how to use it, how to find it, and so on. And they were very interesting to look in details at the 90 companies in, in the index. At the same time, in terms of uh, visibility, we have decided that only for SMEs, um, to uh, expand our partnership with Morningstar, Morningstar sorry, uh, in terms of equity research coverage, and now they are covering also the family business company listed uh, SMEs listed on our markets. And uh, we are working with Guillaume on some roadshow uh, for dedicated to family business companies. So we will uh, we just forget about the sectoral approach. We just forget about the size approach. We will have. Uh, a unique criteria, family business company. And the idea is to bring investors to the company, to the companies in the same region, and to, uh, and to propose to investors to, uh, to spend one or two days uh, to visit and, and meet with uh, listed family business companies. So this is a part for the uh, listed companies, but at the same time, we know, we have the experience with the tech companies two years ago, that there is a lack of education, of understanding, the about the financial markets. So we have decided to launch an educational program for non-listed family business companies. Uh, it's it's a, a six months to one year program, depending on the company. And the idea is just to educate and, uh, and bring some, I would say, expertise and explanation about the financial markets to the company. Of course, we, we do it with a lot of partners, auditors, lawyers, banks, uh, financial communication agencies. And the, um, the idea is just to... Um, to give a full and global picture, real one, with the plus and the minus, of course, and to be able to answer the questions raised by the company, uh, which is different compared to the tech share program, which has been launched for young tech companies two years ago, and now the, the, the program for family businesses companies named uh, Family Share. Is that is this program is a tailor-made one. So we are going to the companies, we are deciding with the, the companies who will be involved in the program, family shareholders, managers, next generation, and each, I would say each program will be different, not in terms of content, but in terms of format um, and, and so on. So we have uh, onboarded the first uh, family businesses companies for this, uh, for this program. Uh, we are very proud, I, I can't tell it because it, it was not so easy. Huh? Um, quite uh, disruptive and uh, due to some uh, discretion reason and or confidential reason uh, to, uh, to convince a company to, to spend uh, six months to one year with us and with some partners is not, is not the most easiest thing I know. Um, so, uh, but now we have, we have been able to onboard roughly speaking 10 companies um, since the beginning of the year, which is quite great. So um, I don't know if they will uh, join us at the end uh, of course, they will, they will keep um, the, the freedom and they will decide if uh, listing is, a, is a interesting for them or not. But at least if they decide to go, they will know why they are uh, coming to the market. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, the, um, what about the investors? So, so Guillaume, your, your auto uh, generation um, uh, fund is w what kind of investors are, are are coming and are they different from 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 the other uh, other type of investor that you know? Uh, <coughs> I would say that historically the customer base of photo generation was mainly uh, other private banks through their own customers, uh, composed essentially of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, small and medium sized business owners. So clearly, people that are that are already convinced by the concept of, uh, of family-owned companies. That was the, the key uh, customer base. 
but uh, I would say that over the last five to six years, uh, institutional shareholders, so pension funds, uh, insurers, uh, have become more important in the funds, probably uh, seeing that uh, the performances of, uh, of the funds and of, uh, uh, of this thematic uh, is clearly working. Uh, they are attracted now in the fund and they tend to account for a bigger proportion. Uh, currently, I would say that 60% of, uh, of the customer base is, is retail and now 40% is uh, institutional investors. So it has changed a little bit. Uh, yeah. And investors are probably seeing that uh, th there is a lot of value in that kind of uh, investments. Thank you. Um, uh, Christophe, uh, a last word before, uh, before we switch to the, to the public. Anything, uh, anything we forgot? No, I, I agree with Eric. We, we need to spend time with the family-owned companies. And uh, uh, I think uh, family share is a brilliant idea. And uh, I, I do believe it will be very efficient. Um, and uh, another thing we, we do together is that uh, we will organize uh, um, after the summer and at the beginning of 2018 uh, dinners with uh, managers from listed companies and and uh, managers from uh, companies who are just wondering what does it mean to be listed. And it's a small format. There are more less than 10 around the table. And there's just uh, discuss and uh, exchange and try to understand and uh, they are really interested in the at the end of the dinner they better know what does it mean Antoine le mot de la fin um, I think we should spare some time for questions because I think I don't have anything to add to your plans which no I problem. find very no interesting problem. no problem thank you guys for your amazing uh, contribution any question from the from the public we still have a we still have a, a 5 minutes before uh, before the handover Monsieur, microphone is coming. Thank you. My name is uh, Chris Coles, the Capital Spillway Trust. I'm curious, only one of you talked about the disparity between the number of German family companies and uh, in France. And surely what you should be talking about is the fact that every startup is a potential family company and you don't have anything like enough of them. And you need to ask why. And I believe the reason is that we're now talking about having to go uh, uh, to the market to capitalize even startups. And your problem is you have insufficient capital structure right down at the grassroots of society so that your startups are not becoming quickly profitable and they're grossly undercapitalized. And so your problem is how do you address that particular aspect of the creation and formation of new companies rather than a debate about whether or not they're um, becoming uh, suitable for further finance from yourselves? Thank you. Uh, I, I beg to disagree. I think there are probably more startups now in France than in Germany. The real difference between France and Germany is the Mittelstand, which has been uh, completely erased in France and which has been vibrant in Germany. And it's mainly down to the tax treatment. Uh, we have made sure family companies were heavily taxed in France, be it with uh, tax on dividends, uh, be it with wealth tax for the minority ones and so on and so forth. And it explains to a large extent the difference between the size of those Mittelstand companies and the number of Mittelstand companies in Germany and France. I think there are three or four times more Mittelstand companies which are in old industries, they're not startups. They are in many, many industries. And I think one of the messages of the new government is uh, to have a fairer treatment of uh, families at the end of the day and also more tax and legal stability, uh, which has been a hallmark of the, the French ways over the past uh, 30 years. And if this can be corrected, there will be more um, 
uh, more Mittelstand types of companies in France. I think it's very mainly due to the, uh, the, the, the tax situation. And Belgium is a case in point. Uh, in Belgium, there is also a vibrant Mittelstand because the tax on family companies is not great, be it succession, be it wealth tax, being dividends, it's a better treatment. So I think we need to have reflections on that in France. But you're right, it's an, it's an issue. Thank you for the great question. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, do you want to, guys, you want to add anything or? No, Antoine said it all. Any other uh, question in the public? No, all right. Well, I think this is the end of the of the panel. Thank you very much for uh, for listening to us, and uh, and thank you for the uh, for the for the panelists. I think it was a very uh, very new uh, debate and very new topic for this for this conference. And I hope we'll come back next year uh, with uh, with an assessment of the of the effort. Thank you so much.